Hello, everyone, and welcome to Royal Botanical Gardens. My name is Karine Davidson-Taylor, and I'm in my basement at home in Guelph. And this is my friend, Justin Chen. He's also with Royal Botanical Gardens, and he's going to be helping me with some of your amazing questions that we are going to take, uh, sort of help us lead us through this presentation about amazing monarchs. But before we go too much further, I just want to make sure we know where we are in relation to each other. So I'm going to switch over to my map. So just give me a second to do that. And some of you may be in the Halton region, some of you may be in the Hamilton region, some of you may be perhaps from other parts of Ontario. So welcome. Now, Royal Botanical Garden is Royal Botanical Gardens is between Hamilton and Burlington and it is right on the southwest tip of Lake Ontario. So let me just go a little bit closer so you can actually see how big Royal Botanical Gardens is. So I'm gonna just use my mouse to go around there. Look at that, it's a big, beautiful green space here. So it's about 1100 hectares. And of that 1100 hectares, only about 100 hectares of that is cultivated gardens. The rest is natural sanctuaries perfect places for all sorts of living things, including monarchs. Before we go too much further though, I want to recognize the long history of the First Nations and the Métis people in the province of Ontario. And I want to pay respects to the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory and the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation. They are the holders of the treaty with the crown for the lands that we are on, that we are the caretakers and the stewards of. So we have a very important role to make sure that this main, is maintained as one of Canada's biodiversity hotspots. I also want you to know that if you ever come onto Royal Botanical Gardens trails, you are on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, of the Huron-Wendat, and of the Anishinaabe. So let's get started with our presentation about amazing monarchs. Now I received a lot of questions and I'm hoping we can get through some of those, but you know, why don't we just start with thinking about what monarch butterflies are to you? And you've probably had a little bit of discussion about this already, you know, thinking about this topic and, and maybe some of you thought, well, I wonder, yep, they are insects. And because they're insects, they have six legs, they have two antenna, and they have three body parts, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. Now, one of the questions we had was, uh, was about the fact that did they have six legs? And they actually do have six legs. Although if you look at a monarch butterfly, you'll sometimes really only see four. There are two other little legs at the very top of their thorax very tiny little legs. And those are what they use to test and taste the milkweed to make sure it's the right quality before they lay their eggs. The other thing about these insects is that they breathe through very small holes on their abdomen, typical of a lot of insects. So let's take a look at something else. Ah, pollinators. Well, you know what? They are pollinators because they do go from flower to flower, but they don't get a lot of pollen wiped on them because they're so tall off the flower. So they're not the best pollinators. Bees obviously are a lot better, but they may, if they get pollen on their bodies and they go to a flower of a similar species, they may get some of that pollen wiped on, the, on that flower. So they could be classified as pollinators. But remember, no matter what you do, if you're going to help provide habitat and a place for monarchs, at the same time, you're also helping a lot of other pollinators. We had questions about them being so colorful and they definitely are colorful. That red or that orange and black that you see there, that's actually a very special color. And we're gonna to come to a little bit more about that a little bit later on, because we had a question about the colors and the scales. That color is a warning color because monarch butterflies can be 
poisonous, not so much that they're going to kill anything, but if an animal should eat the abdomen, that center part right here of a monarch butterfly, they might get an upset stomach and they might vomit, but it's not enough to kill them. They are local and they are migrators. So local right now, you'll have seen, you maybe you've seen some monarchs, maybe you've seen a caterpillar, maybe you've been lucky enough to see an egg. They are migratory, so they do migrate. And we're gonna be talking about that multi-generational migration. So, and that's a pretty amazing thing. And finally, they are at risk. So they are a species at risk here in Ontario, as well as other provinces and states. And in Ontario, they are listed as a species of special concern. Now, one thing I did find out, um, and this relates to a question from Michelle Bozzo's grade two class about the population. And that is that monarchs, I can't tell you exactly how many monarchs there are in the world right now, but I can tell you that the population or the area that the monarchs were down in Mexico that area decreased by 26% this year. And that's a very large amount. And so whenever they're talking about where monarchs are or how many there are, they don't actually do a single count, one, two, three. What they look is the area of the forest that the monarchs are, where the monarchs are in Mexico. And they make an estimate, they make a, a guess as to how many monarchs are there, but they, because the area was smaller, therefore the numbers of monarchs are smaller too. So let's continue. Oh yes, and they are inspirers. I can't forget about this wonderful Lego um, exhibit that we had. And this was the one about the monarch butterfly on the swamp milkweed. And if you can see that little label down there, there they used over 60,000 Lego blocks to make that beautiful sculpture. So when we look at monarchs, there are males and there are females. And I'm just wondering if anybody, if you look at this one, you might see that there is a bit of a difference between the male and the female. Now, I know it looks like sh the female's a little bit darker. Some people may see the veins of a male a little bit thinner than the female, but that isn't always the best one. The best marker, and you may have got my clue, spot the difference. I wonder if anybody saw these two spots. So these are the pheromone dots. These are the dots. These are, are they produce a, 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 a smell or uh, something that's attractive to females. So let me show you a couple of butterflies up a little bit closer. So I'm going to switch over to my butterflies that I have right here. Let me see if I can get that color a bit better. There we go. So I have two butterflies. I have a female and I have a male. But if you look at the veins, yeah, see, they're very similar. There's not a lot of difference in the size of those veins. But this, when the wings are closed, you have to be very careful to look. That is the little dot right there on the side of the wings that are closed. So there you can see it really well. Justin, did we have any questions? I think we did about the wings. Yes, we had a number of questions about the colors of these butterflies. So maybe we'll start uh, with kind of some more general questions uh, mm -hmm. because students from uh, Jenny Behe and Lisa Gesso's class at Tom Thompson Public School, uh, as well as uh, our friends um, from St. Timothy in Miss uh, DeMarchi's kindergarten class, and Emmett and Marlo from Lisa Kim's class at Kilbride. They wanted to know uh, about kind of where the colors come from. Uh, and, and I think they've learned that these butterflies have scales 
uh, and they're kind of wondering why do butterflies have scales? Okay, so these scales, and I do, I can't get any closer than I'm already getting, but I think you can see. Let me see if I can focus that a little bit better. But I think you can see that each one of these, it almost looks like there's a little pixelation, if you can see that little squares. And that's what those scales, so those scales are sort of like little plates. And each of those little plates, each of those scales, those are the colors. And you can see there, you know, there are sort of that orangey yellow color and you've got that, um, you've got that white, you've got the black. So each one of those scales is, that, is their own color. But that color that you see is created with something called pigment. So there's pigment in those scales. That's what gives it their color. And those scales can be very small. Now we're gonna take a look, a picture, a look at a picture a little later on that will show a butterfly's uh, head really close up. So you'll be able to see those scales much better. But, those, but that's what's giving the color for that butterfly. Um, and those colors, as I said, is pigment. It's what colors, in a sense, some things are sometimes our skin or something like that. But those colors are because of what that butterfly ate as a caterpillar. And was there another question, Justin, about? Something? Yeah, and you might have answered a little bit about it. Uh, so we had a couple of grade two classes, one from Kingswood Public or Kingswood Drive Public School, uh, and then Miss Leon's grade two class from Canadian Martyrs Public School. And they were wondering, do monarchs come in other colors? Mm -hmm. And they were curious about the patterns and the spots and uh, why the monarch has those patterns. Yeah, so monarchs, <clears throat> these this group of monarchs is only like what you're seeing is what normally happens. These are the colors that a monarch normally is. That orange and black is really actually a warning color. So remember we said that they were poisonous. Well, that orange and black is saying, whoa, stop, don't eat me. If you do, I might make you vomit. So that orange and black is a warning color. Those little white and black spots on the edge are sort of, now somebody I think mentioned camouflage. They're sort of like camouflage. They're, they're drawing the bird's attention to those edges of their wings. And if a bird should take a little nibble from the edge of the wing, not a problem. That's not a problem. Uh, it might make it a little bit wobbly, but it will still be able to fly without any issue but that's going to be attractive to birds because that butterfly does not want that bird to get its abdomen. So it's saying, come here and take this. Uh, I can survive without the little bit of the nip, but it doesn't want that bird to get the abdomen that's right down here. So that's a really good set of questions. So let's, let's uh, continue and let's take a look a little bit closer at monarchs. Now, oh yes, I meant to ask, tell you this. So there are other um, butterflies that take advantage of this black and orange warning color. And these are called viceroy butterflies. Now they're a little bit smaller. They don't feed on milkweed like monarchs do, but they feed on willow and poplar. And by the way, that is their caterpillar but because they feed on a plant that is also a little, has a chemical in it that's a little bitter, they have these same warning colors. But you always know that this is a Viceroy because it's got this little smile on its hind wings, almost to say, ha ha, I fooled you. Oh no, you didn't, we know. So monarchs are found all across Canada and, and relatively quite far north when you look at how far some of them will go. So we'll take a little bit closer look at that in, later on in the presentation, but there are two groups of monarchs. So there's the group here in British Columbia and that's what we call the Western population. And then there's a group from Alberta all the way over here to Newfoundland and Labrador. That is the Eastern population. And that's where most of our discussion will be about is the Eastern population. So when we think about monarchs and what they need to eat, you know, they need a lot of things, but they need two types of food. So I'm wondering if you can guess what those two types of food are. 
So you think about it and let's see if you came up with the same answer. Ah. So monarchs need two types of food because a butterfly adult has a completely different mouth than a caterpillar does. So the butterfly needs food that will be able to, so from the flowers, it needs the nectar. Whereas a caterpillar must eat the leaf of a milkweed only. That's it. So Justin, was there a question about the adult butterfly and food? Yeah, so there's definitely lots of questions about what butterflies like to eat, what their favorite food is, and it is great that you mentioned how they uh, really like that milkweed. Now, we had a, an interesting question from Colleen Dernan Boyle's grade two class, and they wanted to know, why do the butterflies have long tongues? Well, I am going to hopefully show this to you. So I've got a... a, a a little video here, and I'm hoping you're going to be able to see this. This is a monarch, and it is on a lovely pink flower. But you can see those four legs, and you can see how tall it stands. But that is its long tongue, or proboscis, going all the way down deep into that flower, because that nectar is deep in that flower. So you look at how it goes down. Look at that. And you can see how high that butterfly is. It's not going to get too much of its body wiped on the pollen that's here in this little yellow part. So we'll just take a look at that again. There, we'll play that again so you can see it, how deep it goes in to get that sweet nectar. So that's its proboscis. And that's why it's so long, because it has to get so deep. So any flowers that you see, that have long, have tubular, you know, that are long and sort of tubular. That's what a monarch really does like. That's sort of what their favorite type of flower is, is those long tubular flowers. So if that's the case, then they need to have a long proboscis. And look at this, it just goes around and around and around. And it's actually made of two parts. So when that butterfly comes out of the chrysalis, it's going to put those two parts together. And it's not this part that gets the nectar. It's not this part that gets the nectar. It's the part in the middle that the nectar flows up. You can see my butterfly. You can see these are the scales. So you see what they look almost like little plates. And then these are these big, beautiful eyes that a butterfly has. So now caterpillars can only eat milkweed. That is the only plant they can eat. Now, there are lots of different species of milkweed, but that's the only thing they can eat. They don't eat anything else. Um, and the adults will only lay the eggs on milkweed. So here's some examples of the milkweed. So here in Ontario, we have common milkweed, Asclepius syriaca, and it is found all over the place, as you can see, but it is not found in British Columbia and Alberta. They have other types of milkweed. So we have, so this is what you might see if you came to Royal Botanical Gardens, you might have this in your own garden. This is um, butterfly weed. This pink one is swamp milkweed. Here again is uh, the, uh, oh, the common milkweed and oak milkweed. But this beautiful one up here, this is called showy milkweed. And this is the one that's in British Columbia. So we don't have this one, but it's a very beautiful one. So if you have a really good pollinator and especially monarch friendly garden, you're looking for plants that feed the adults and plants that feed the caterpillars. So I've got a question for you. And so I want you to think about it. The butterfly life cycle has four parts. So what do you think? Yes, no, not sure. That's what that sideways thumb is. So I'll let you think about it. The butterfly life cycle has four parts. <clears throat> okay, here we go. Yes, it has four parts. 
So it starts with the egg and then the caterpillar or larva, then up here to the pupa or chrysalis. So we use the word cocoon for moths, we use the word chrysalis for butterflies, and eventually the adult. Now, I think there might be a question about, about eggs, but I'm not sure, but I just wanna quickly show you this because here are two monarchs mating. And then soon after, about three, four days later, the female will lay her eggs on these leaves. And you can see her abdomen poking up and then it will lay that egg on that leaf. Do, Justin, was there a question? I'm not sure. Yeah, so you just answered a couple of questions that came in about how butterflies lay eggs and can butterflies lay eggs. But mm -hmm. there's one other interesting question uh, from Mr. Root and Ms. Tomlinson's students. Uh, and that was, what season are butterflies born in? Well, you know, the butterflies will arrive here in Ontario in the end of May, beginning of June. And that's when they're going to start laying eggs. And so they'll lay eggs uh, depending on the generation. But you will find eggs all the way from that time all the way up to um, August. And that's when the butterflies will lay their eggs is in the summer. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And they, they only lay them on milkweed leaves, no other plant, because that is the only plant that their caterpillars can eat. So an egg might be laid on the bottom of the leaf. It might be laid on the top of the leaf, as you can see up here, or it might be laid even in the flower. So I have a couple of eggs because they are very, very small and it's, it's hard to see how small they are, but I've got a couple of eggs here. So I'm just gonna show those eggs to you unless hopefully you'll be able to see them too. So let me switch over <clears throat> and I've got them right here. So look at there, can you see that egg right there? There's one right there, let me go up really close. There we go. So that is a little egg and there's my finger. So you could probably fit about 10 of those little eggs on the top of your finger. And then I've got another little egg right over here. There's another little one right there. And I expect that little one based on its color, I expect that one is gonna come out pretty soon. So I've got those two eggs. I was hoping one of them would have come out, but mm, unfortunately, it didn't. Now, there was a question, um, I think, from Miss Hunt's class at St. Marguerite Duville about um, wanting to know um, why monarch, monarch butterflies die after they lay their eggs. And it is, they do. And they do because it takes a lot of energy to lay those eggs. They lay sometimes between 200 and 400 eggs. And that's a lot of work to do. And they do that sort of within a three to four week period. That's, it, it takes a lot of energy to lay those eggs. And when that job is done, because that's, their, that's what they have to do, is they have to lay eggs. And when that job is done, then that's when their life is done as well. So this little caterpillar is almost ready to come out and it's gonna be in that egg for uh, three to five days. And then eventually what will happen is it will start to chew its way out of the egg. So we were very lucky. We have a very nice camera that can get us really close onto our plants, but I took advantage of it and I used it to take a video of this little caterpillar eating its way out of the egg. So keep watching because what I did is I sort of made it go a little bit faster in some plates, but at one point we're going to get to get to real time. And I'll tell you when we get to real time. So you just keep watching because I think you're going to be amazed at what comes out of this egg. <clears throat> keep watching. And we're at real time now.
And there he, it is out. And what it's going to do is it's going to go right back and it's going to finish eating that egg. That's what it has to do. It has to get rid of all that egg because that egg has got a lot of good nutrition in it. But that is its first meal. After that, then it has to start eating the milkweed. And you can see this little tiny caterpillar right here. That's my husband's thumb. And it's going to start really small. So, um, <clears throat> Justin, did we have a question um, about what caterpillars eat? <clears throat> yeah, so there were a few questions about kind of eating. Uh, and and I think you've mentioned a lot about milkweed and our friends from Jen Behe and Lisa Jesso's class in Tom, uh, Tom Thompson were wondering why do caterpillars only eat milkweed? Well, there's something in milkweed called latex. And it's that if you ever break milkweed and you'll see that white sort of milky stuff, that's what gives it its name, milkweed, that white milky stuff is called latex. And that latex has a chemical in it that um, the monarch caterpillars will eat and it gives them some protection, but also that milky stuff in that plant is giving that plant protection as well. It doesn't taste very good for a lot of animals, but if an animal does eat it, then that latex will also make a little scab over where that animal ate, so it will help protect the plant. But the monarch caterpillars eat that milkweed because it helps give them the colors that we all recognize as a caterpillar color, the, or the yellow and the black. And then that color will also be, that protection in color will also happen with the adults, but that's because of the milkweed that they ate. So those little caterpillars are gonna eat and eat and eat and poop and rest and eat and eat and eat and poop and rest. And that's what they do. They do a lot of that. And they'll, they'll do that for about 10 to 14 days. So they're gonna go from this tiny little caterpillar all the way to this big one. And it will go through five changes. Now, the thing about a caterpillar is that they are an insect and insects are covered with an exoskeleton. They, so that exoskeleton is not like our skin. That caterpillar may feel soft, but they're not covered with skin like us. Our skin will grow. A caterpillar's exoskeleton will not grow. So imagine if you were wearing clothes that you wore when, a when you were a baby, they wouldn't fit. And if you tried to put them on, they might rip. And that's exactly what happens to the exoskeleton of a caterpillar. What happens is they eat so much that that exoskeleton will rip and then they will make their way out of that exoskeleton. So there it is right there. And this little caterpillar has come right out of it and it has to rest. And, and sort of because it, that's been really hard work for it. But what, what's left behind, this molted exoskeleton is called an exuvia. Isn't that a great word? Exuvia. So they'll, but when they're ready, they'll go back up and they'll eat it. So there's nothing left behind because that's got a lot of good nutrition in it too. So that little caterpillar is going to, it's going to gain about 27 hundred times its mass. It's going to become huge. But eventually it's going to have to find a place to pupate. It's going to have to find a place to make its chrysalis. So that chrysalis, I believe we had a question. Yes. So we had a few questions mm -hmm. coming about uh, uh, the chrysalis and I'll just uh, give them to you and then I think you should be able to answer them all mm -hmm. kind of Order. So Danielle uh, in Diane Neufeld's class at Corpus Christi was wondering, one, how do caterpillars form a chrysalis? Mm -hmm. And then we received a few questions from Madame Bullock's grade one class at Earl Kitchener School. And they were wondering, why do butterflies go into a chrysalis? 
and then uh, kind of how do the caterpillars turn into the butterfly from the chrysalis? Kind of what is going on inside of there? Excellent questions. And I love this question because I think people are so surprised. So when that caterpillar has reached that fifth instar, when it's a big, big, fat, ready to pupate caterpillar, it's going to go away from its plant <coughs> where it's been eating and pooping. It's going to go away and find a special place to make a chrysalis or to become a chrysalis. Now, what's crazy is that I rarely find a chrysalis. They are very difficult to find because, they, because that's when they are a chrysalis, they are not protected very well. So they're easy targets for other, other monarchs, but they're easy targets for other animals to eat because there's nothing to protect them. They may taste bad, but that's not enough. So when they're ready to pupate, they will go someplace else. They will go into what's known as a J shape. So you can see that J shape like that. And that is your clue that something is going to happen. So I have these really cool videos from the archive, um, the Images of Life on Earth video series. And I just wanna share these with you. So I'm gonna walk you through this. And so here is a little caterpillar going up the plant. Oh, and but I'm just gonna stop for a second. Remember I told you about how they breathe and they have these little breathing holes on their abdomen? There is one of those little breathing holes right there. And there's another one right there. So those are the little breathing holes. So this little caterpillar is gonna make its way up and all the time a caterpillar is on a leaf, they're always laying down silk. See the little silk right there, his legs holding onto it. They lay down that silk and that acts like a little safety net. But that silk comes from underneath its lower jaw, under its labium, and it's gonna go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth because it's making this little silk button. That's what that is right there. So when it's satisfied that it's big enough, it's gonna turn itself around. And then what it will do is it will latch on with the back end of its abdomen, hook that, hook that back end into that silk button so make sure it's really secure because it's the only thing <coughs> that it's holding on to. And then this is what's going to happen. It does not go to goop. It does not go liquid inside. What happens is the cells that were part of the caterpillar are slowly changing to be the cells that were the needed for a monarch butterfly, for an adult. And at the same time, the exoskeleton is starting to loosen. So I'm gonna stop it here for a second and I'm gonna just, oh, keep watching. So what's gonna happen is it's gonna split. It's gonna split down here and then that exuvia there. Okay, I'm gonna stop it right there because I wanna show you something. So there's the exuvia, that's the exoskeleton. There is the head right there of the butterfly. There is the wing of the butterfly. There's the thorax where the wings and the legs are. And this is the abdomen. So the, it's already started to become a butterfly, but you'll notice the colors aren't there. And the colors aren't there because the scales haven't developed and other things haven't. So this is just the beginning of the butterfly. So let's keep watching because, and then it's going to wiggle, 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 wiggle. And it's gonna, that exuvia is gonna pop off. And then that little black post called the cream master, make sure it's on and then keep watching, keep watching. There is the chrysalis. But inside that chrysalis is the beginnings of that butterfly. And so what's going to happen over time, the legs will develop further, the antennae will develop further, the scales will develop so that you can see the colors. And if you look carefully at this chrysalis, you'll see that it has little black stripes. That's going to be the wings. That's where the wings are. And when that chrysalis is ready, <clears throat> when that butterfly is ready to come out, then you'll start seeing the colors of that butterfly. That's your clue that any, very soon that butterfly will be coming out and it will, it will expand right here and it will split <coughs> right here. 
And then, so here's the video for it. Watch this. So it's going to split along the edge right here. And then the butterfly will slowly, slowly come out of that chrysalis. It's holding on really tight. And you'll notice the size of the wings, the size of the abdomen, but watch the, watch the proboscis, the tongue, two parts. There they go, coming together. And then that, see that butterfly's holding on, holding on, because it has to. But what's going to happen is the abdomen is gonna pump the fluid from that abdomen, or the butterfly's gonna pump the fluid from the abdomen into the veins of the wings. So those wings come out really scrunchial, but then gradually, gradually, that fluid goes into the wings and it makes the wings stronger and flatter and they dry so that eventually that butterfly will be able to fly. So it will be, it will take, it will take a, oh, about one to two hours before that butterfly is ready to go. So that's what it looks like. There's still a little bit of time. There's still a little bit of a bend there. So it's got a little bit of ways to go. And ah, did you see that it's a male? right there. So that little butterfly goes from this point, scrunchial, scrunchial little wings, all the way to these great big abdomen. And then, oh, and look at the proboscis, look at the tongue. And then in just a short time, maybe one or two hours, it's the adult. So We've talked a lot about the life cycle, and I really want to make sure that we also get a chance to talk about the migration. So that is a really important part of, of the butterfly's life. And Justin, I believe we had some questions about migration, although I'm going to answer quite a few of them, I think, as we go along. But is there... Yes. A, mm -hmm. So definitely. So... Uh... You kind of answered one question already. Uh, some of the students from Maria Elise Van Nuys grade three class at Lawfield are wondering, do butterflies hibernate now? I know that monarchs, they're gonna migrate, but there are some butterflies, uh, one called the morning cloak that does actually hibernate uh, here and stays here for the winter. Uh, but that class was also wondering how far can a butterfly fly? Mm -hmm. So maybe you, uh, that's a good, place to start when you're talking about migration. Absolutely, and absolutely. And, and you know, the, one of the things, one of the reasons why they migrate is because it's too cold here in the winter time and they're insects. And, you know, a lot of insects will either leave eggs or they'll leave pupa or they'll leave caterpillars or they'll leave something that they will, they don't necessarily survive the winter. And monarchs are one that cannot survive the winter as adults. They have to fly south where it is warmer. And so we know a lot about this because of work that was done by Dr. Fred Urquhart and his wife and so many volunteers um, it, between 1946 and 1976. 30 years it took them to discover just by people observing the tags that they put on the butterflies and we still do that now, but if it wasn't for their volunteer work, the work that they did to discover that, we would not know that monarchs go down to Mexico. So the monarchs that fly down to Mexico, they're slightly bigger, they've got a bigger abdomen because they're eating and eating and eating and eating it, and they need to eat so that they can sort of build up their fat reserves, sort of like a bear would before it starts to hibernate. Well, this animal has to build up its fat reserves so it can make that long journey at the end of August, beginning of, or in and September, all the way down to Mexico. It tries to feed on the way, but it's not always easy because there's not always places for it to stop. So it has to make sure it's got as much food as possible. And that journey is going to be about 4,000 kilometers. It'll take about two, two and a half months because they fly about 150 kilometers a day. Um, and they only fly during the daytime. And at night, what they do is they find a tree and they'll roost in that tree. And if it, in the sort of cooler times, they'll try and find lots of other monarchs to, to uh, roost with to help keep them warm. They'll get down to Mexico late October, early November, and that's where they will be for the next two, two and a half months at least. So in Mexico, there are some very special forests 
And they are now protected areas in Mexico where these monarchs go. Um, so this is an example, believe it or not, you're not looking at dead leaves, you're looking at monarchs in the trees. Now, remember what I said about how the, the percentage of monarchs that were down in Mexico had decreased by nearly 26%. And partly it's because their habitat, the forests are gone because of logging. So, and because of farming, because people have to make a living. So there's a lot of work being done between, you know, to help support the families that are in this area, but also to help support the monarchs. So they cluster in these trees, all sorts of them. And then here is a little video to show you what it's like. So <clears throat> they will be in these trees. So it's really difficult to count individual monarchs, but what they do is they say, okay, in one hectare of land, there will be between 10 and 50 million monarchs, but you can see them on all these trees. So they use those trees to cluster on, but occasionally they will come down to streams and rivers because they have to drink. They have to have something to drink, just like we do, insects need to drink as well. And when they come down to the ground like this, to creeks or even to sandy beaches, you may have seen uh, butterflies come down to sandy beaches and you're going, that's what they're doing. They're taking a drink. It's called puddling. And this is something you can do in your backyard if you've got um, if you've got flowers in a place. You could even put a little bowl of water with some stones in it and, and you might attract some insects to that, to give that little drink of water. Just make sure you change it every so often. So look at that, masses and masses of monarchs. Then they'll go back up to the trees and they'll continue resting in those trees. So this journey is a long journey. And you know, sometimes, not all the monarchs obviously make it. There are a lot of monarchs that will die because they didn't put enough, they didn't eat enough on the way. So they weren't, didn't have enough fat reserves. They may have been eaten by other animals when they were there. Perhaps it was just too cold. Perhaps it was a storm. And so some monarchs don't make it, but if they make it, if they live, then they will mate because up and on, they didn't mate before. So then they will mate and they will start to travel to Texas. So our Ontario monarchs in September traveled all the way down to, to Mexico, stayed there in the winter, and then at the end of February, March, they traveled up to Texas, and that's where they mated, laid eggs, and died. And then their children, so that's that first generation, their children flew up, to this part of the United States. And they mated, laid eggs, and died. Their children maybe stayed or flew further north. And then they mated, laid eggs, and died. And then eventually, we got them here in Ontario in late May, early June. And we will have between two and three generations here in Ontario. And then that final generation will be the ones that fly down to Mexico. So these little eggs that I've got right here, these little eggs are the great grandchildren of September's monarchs. So they have done a lot of traveling, but it's not just, so you've gone, through several generations. But as I said, here in Ontario, we'll have about uh, two to three generations. And then it, they'll make that, that last big super generation will fly down to Mexico. So there's lots of things you can do to help monarchs. You can plant milkweed, you can plant nectar flowers. So you're having food for the adults and a place for the adults to lay the eggs and what caterpillars can eat. You can help scientists know what's happening by just reporting what you see. And there are a couple of places you can do that. You can go on to Mission Monarch. And there's a great teacher resource on Mission Monarch that you can take advantage of. And this is also a wonderful thing for families to do. Find the milkweed, 
See if you can see eggs or caterpillars. Write that down and then put that in your form online and submit it. And that will be great stuff. Now, Mission Monarch is part of, it's out of the Insectarium in Montreal. So this is really important for Canadians to participate in. The other one that you can also learn more about is Journey North. And Journey North is another one that you can use to submit and let people know what's happening. I'm just going to try and share <clears throat> my web page here. Oh, just a minute. I have to come out of this just for a second. So let me just stop sharing for a second and while I switch over. And Justin, were there any last little questions that maybe I need to take a quick look at that I have? Well, I think it's uh, kind of a fun question. Now, mm -hmm. I think uh, we answered the question from Ms. DeVincentis and Ms. Uh, Brezzi's uh, kindergarten class about uh, how long it takes. It's definitely a long journey to fly down to Mexico. Um, and then we had friends from uh, Miss Lofman and Miss Arsenault's class that were wondering about how monarchs sleep uh, or, you know, it's a lot, it's a long trip. They, they must take a nap at some point, I know, right? I know. We need to stop at the rest stop. Exactly. So monarchs actually at nighttime, what they'll do is they will stop in trees and they'll rest in trees. But here's the thing. Do you know, we have eyelids. We can close our eyes. Monarchs don't have eyelids. Insects don't have eyelids. They can't close their eyes. So they don't actually go to sleep like we do, but they rest. So they just go, ah, they take a little, a little break like that. So, and they'll rest in the trees. And then when it's sunny and warm, off they go again. So let's just see if I can Fantastic. open up that web page that I want to show you for Journey North. And what's really exciting is that, and I'm hoping I can play this. So what's really exciting is that, you know, these, all these dots represent sightings, represent what people have seen. Look at those monarchs. So this is where monarchs have been seen. They're, and the darker the color, the further along it is in the calendar. So you can see, so some monarchs, some people saw monarchs all the way early in, in uh, May. Look at that. And they look where they are in Ontario. Look how far north. Up in Thunder Bay, Kenora area, Cochrane. They're so far north. But as long as there is milkweed, there will be monarchs. And you can see also the difference between our eastern population here. But there's a lot of people doing observations. And here is the western population. No observations yet in, in uh, lower British Columbia, but it will happen. It will happen because they have been noted. But this poor population is having a really, Western population is having a really hard time. But we can help monarchs very easily by making sure that we provide habitat for them. If we can do anything to help them, that would be the most important thing is try to plant milkweed, any kind of milkweed you can, and try to have some flowers there. For those adults to get the food that they need to survive. So we've had a lot of exploration today with monarchs and seen a lot of different things. I hope this has provided you some for some inspiration to perhaps provide some habitat in your garden. I want to thank you for joining me. Thank you, Justin, so much for helping me with this. It's absolutely wonderful to have you with me. And I look forward to meeting all of you again another day. So thanks very much for joining me and have a great day.